Well, this is worrying. Young drivers have a 30% greater risk of crashing in their first year if they drive their own car compared to those who borrow the family car, an extensive study of New South Wales young drivers has found. Oh my God, the children. What can possibly be done. Study co-author Professor Rebecca Ivers says if there was one key learning from the study for concerned parents, it's don't buy your kids a car and give them unlimited access to it. One key learning. Learning. It's a lesson, surely. You might be learning the frickin' banjo, dude, but the things you learn are lessons. <laughs> Hashtag FFS. How hard is this really for a university? Still, what a relief. Reduce the risk of your kid crashing by uh, not buying them a car. Or if you do, don't let them drive it. Dude, this is why I love academics. They make things so freaking simple. Cut your risk of obesity by not eating. Slash your risk of being stabbed by not running with scissors. See what I did there? Incinerate the risk of bushfire by not tuning up your flamethrower in a hundred hectares of dry grass. The studies we could do on this shit are endless, dude. In other news, parents who buy their kids a Tyrannosaurus Rex are 92% more likely to see the family eaten one night by a giant fuck-off lizard from 75 million years ago. Sadly, researchers are no closer to solving this horrific problem. I'm John Logan from AllNoExpert.com.au, Newcastle Cheap, Australia only, website, come on. So, here's the basic headline. Don't buy your kids a car. Young drivers with owned cars in more crashes. University of New South Wales, Sydney, new research shows young drivers who share the family car are less likely to crash than those who drive their own car. New research, new, on drivers who were P-platers from 2002 and 2003. So that was before most cars had stability control or autonomous emergency braking, basic safety systems we take for granted today. 20 year old technology, plus a bit. No word in the release about whether we controlled for the distance driven. Not that normal people typically keep meticulous records of that for like two decades. I hate these kinds of studies, dude, like I freaking hate them. They get a sample of the population and they crunch numbers like they do statistical analyses, in this case, on 20,000 people who were P-platers more than two decades ago. And then they break a golden rule. They go from population level statistical numbers and then they presume to give you specific parental advice. Don't buy your kids a car. That's a Himalaya of horse shit right there. And I'm going to call it out. You can buy an EV if you want. That's allowed. Free country, blah, blah, blah. But it's going to depreciate to nearly nothing in 10 to 12 years, if it lasts that long. And it's not actually that effective against climate change. But for less than 20 grand, you can get a quality rooftop solar system with a battery backup. If you've already got solar, you can just add a battery. That's dead easy too. Solar's gonna slash your electricity bill, add value to your house, protect you from power failures, and the battery can store the electricity that you generate during the day and divorce you from the grid overnight for a fraction of the cost of an EV. Visit autoexpert.com.au slash solar now. I've just partnered with a leading Australian solar specialist. I've known the owners for years. They do hundreds of installations every month. They handle the whole thing, the rebate, the approvals, the bureaucracy, and they use only quality components from suppliers with good local support. In other words, the roof's not going to be leaking afterwards and you won't be emailing the help desk in China if there's some problem. 
They'll just sort it for you. In most cases, you're going to be up and running in a day. If you don't know a kilowatt hour from an inverter, no problem. You'll get a reliable system that'll slash your power bill at least and might even be cash flow positive. It can even make your house apocalypse proof. Not only can you get seamless blackout protection, the solar array can continue to charge the battery when the power is out. That'll keep you going for days. Extreme weather events and grid instability, that's just how the future's gonna be. This is protection against that, and it's easy to do at a fraction of the cost of an EV. Nobody likes paying for electricity, I get that. And it's never gonna get cheaper. This is how you divorce yourself from that upward spiral, as well as burning the coal that goes with it. Coal is, of course, the biggest source of CO2 emission in Australia. Home solar is how you take effective climate action today. And unlike an EV, a good solar system with a backup battery will typically add many times its cost in value to your house. Visit autoexpert.com.au slash solar today. Just fill in the contact form and find out how simple and cost effective the right solar and battery system for your home can be. Don't buy your kids a car, you irresponsible bastard. This seems like a reason for you as a parent to feel quite guilty, shamefully enough. Literally, it seems to imply you might kill your kid if you buy them a car. That's certainly what the headline implies to me. And the stupidity of this really needs to be called out. What if your kid lands an apprenticeship to be perhaps a builder. This is more a caution against thinking a car is a perfect gift when public transport or other safer alternatives are readily available. This is advice from a co-author of the study named Professor Teresa Senseric from the University of Western Australia. I'd retort, good luck getting on the bus as a 17-year-old apprentice carrying a giant 200 kilo box labelled Makita or Milwaukee and then legging it, carrying said box, three to five k's to the estate where all the new houses are going up, but to which the bus routes are, as yet, unfucking allocated You probably need a vehicle if you are an apprentice in the building trades as just one small example. And there are probably 25 billion variations on this theme, such as the kid in regional bumfuck who gets a job the next town over. What's the alternative for such a kid? Ride the magic carpet? If you work on a lathe in industry, you are more likely to be injured by a lathe. And it is a murderous motherfucker of a machine, potentially. Like, it wants to kill you. It just wants you to drop your guard once, dude. It's far more dangerous in that respect than a car. And there are far fewer systematic safeguards. If you work in a wood shop, you are far more likely to see your fingers, like, randomly distributed all over the frickin' floor at the behest of a table saw. And if you work way up a frickin' ladder, gravity is far more likely to fuck you over. Go figure. If you drive a lot, you're more likely to be injured driving. Inexperience and overconfidence are quite a bad combination in all of these circumstances, up a ladder, in front of the tools, or behind the wheel. In high-income countries like Australia, there's a culture that says you get your own car, you're out on the road and you're free and independent, says Professor Ivers. On this, I would argue that freedom and independence are far from just frivolous concepts. They are actually pretty important things for young people to develop, are they not? Driving is not just about randomly moving down the road at midnight with your trousers off and a spliff in one hand, that's a bad idea for complete disambiguation. Don't do it. 
For many young people, driving is about getting to work at Le Fart de Sparrow and driving for more than an hour just to get there. That's what becoming responsible often involves. Getting up in the dark, getting home maybe in the dark, doing all the shit jobs on the building site in between. Literally manning up to get ahead. That's how that works. I'd further argue that if you do that, i.e. gainful employment as a youth, you're far less likely to find yourself driving off your face at midnight with your vegetables hanging out in the breeze. Perhaps simply because it's too hard to get to the building site in the dark in just a few hours' time. Hashtag responsibility. Needs must, whatever. There is, of course, an alternative to freedom and independence, isn't there? We could just raise a nation of 40-year-old children in a kind of automotive North Korea where you only get your own car when Uncle Kim smiles down upon you in your 50s, if you're real lucky. Dear professors, every kid is not the same. Some kids are completely irresponsible little shitheads and some have their heads properly screwed on. So there's that. Some need a car, some don't. There's a lot of variation. Some self-entitled rich teenage shitheads are going to demand a BMW for mommy and daddy simply because they managed to finish private school without getting arrested. They're probably going to be a pox on society in many respects for quite some time, including whenever they get behind the wheel. Similarly, I suppose if mommy is a human trafficker and daddy is a pimp, you're probably going to join the family business and I guess driving like a douchebag will probably become one of your core skills. In between these societal extremes, most people living normal lives are just trying to be responsible and get ahead. Let's not forget that if you are an apprentice cabinet maker or fit a machinist, you're going to get ongoing incremental training. There's workplace safety legislation. You're going to be exposed to potentially dangerous circumstances and you're going to learn to come home with all of your fingers still attached, etc., hopefully because you'll be trained. But driving's not like that, is it? Getting your provisional license is the start of your apprenticeship, in a sense, but it's the end of your training, which is fucking insane. Experienced tradesmen are going to yell at you when you do dangerous things at work. Ask me how I know. I'd suggest an advanced driving course every six months for the first three years that you drive a car might be a real asset for a young driver. What a lovely gift from parents who really care. Perhaps one of the best gifts ever. Because, you know, driving is a somewhat perishable skill and it is possible to get properly good at it. And who knows, if you do that, you might even start taking pride in doing it safely. If academics wanted to make the roads safer, I'd suggest they could research how to get people to, I don't know, keep their fucking heads upright in corners or simply drop back from the car in front and put both hands on the wheel at nine and three and or look as far down the road as possible and or Scan friggin' intersections for assholes failing to give way before just streaming through and hoping for the best. Disgracefully enough, all of these things I just mentioned are advanced driving skills in Australia. I'd also suggest that driving is a remarkably safe activity, despite the abject shit level of training which most people get. In Australia, we drive more than 200 billion kilometres every year on often some fairly shit roads, which is, of course, a product of having a small population and a relatively large land mass. There's not that much money to spend per kilometre of road. We drive more than 30 return trips to Pluto in total. And it's not even a fucking planet, dude. Why do we bother? About 1,300 people 
lose their lives every year. In 2023, it was 1,266. Each death is obviously a great personal tragedy and in many cases preventable, most likely. But this, at the same time, is a remarkably low death rate. And of course, that number includes all the intentional fuckwittery, the high range drink driving, the people driving 50 k's an hour over the speed limit, it includes the recidivist assholes who continue to drive even after being disqualified for, I don't know, more than 10 years, often while drunk or tripping at speed with a couple of unrestrained kids in the back seat. Like, go to court on traffic day. It's unfucking believable Plus, there's the hardened criminals out there who turn their headlights off at night and they drive on the wrong side of the road at $1.50 because that is a really, really great way to get the cops to discontinue their pursuit. Like... What have they got to lose, these people? If they've got four outstanding warrants for proper crimes, they're either going to jail or they're going to get away, right? Like, fuck you, society. It's all about them. Imagine how safe driving would be if we fixed all of that. Of those 1,300-ish Australians who died on the road, pedestrians account for roughly 140 deaths, which is slightly more than 10%, and cyclists are about 40 deaths, which is about 3%, motorcyclists roughly 200 deaths, which is, call it 20%. So, if you take out the assholes and the vulnerable road users, and you concentrate just on people actually in vehicles who are trying to do the right thing, Driving in Australia is remarkably safe. If you are sitting in a car, your statistical risk of dying is quite remote. And this study is therefore worthless, I would argue, because it highlights something that to me is tantamount to irrelevant noise. It's like ultimate academic clickbait. It's little more than a tabloid headline seeking some kind of justification. It goes without saying that if you take an activity with inherently low risk, like driving responsibly, and you increase that risk somewhat by being young or overconfident or inexperienced and in your own car, you arrive at a point where the absolute risk is elevated a little, but it's still relatively insignificant. In case you were wondering how dangerous driving actually is, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which is a federal government department, car occupant deaths are about 53% of all transport deaths. They kill about three people for every 100,000 Australians. Accidental falls, right? <laughs> they kill seven times more Australians than that. Suicide kills more than four times as many Australians as being in a car. This is a confronting subject, suicide, I get that. And if you are confronted by it, you can always contact Lifeline in Australia on 13 11 14 or SMS on 0477 13 11 14. That's 0477 13 11 14. Moving on. Accidental poisoning kills twice as many Australians as being in a car. Choking and suffocation kills 33% more of us than being in a car. And I'd suggest if you were to vox pop median numpties out there, they'd all get this wrong. What's more dangerous? It'd be driving every time you are more likely to die on average from accidental poisoning or choking slash suffocation than being the occupant of a car. Take a moment, dude. Let that sink in. Driving is safe. Falls, suicide, accidental poisoning and choking are all more dangerous vis-a-vis -vis the population level ambient risk of sitting your lardy freaking ass in a car. 
Most of us are not all that worried about being murdered or about drowning, I note. I think that would be fair to say. I haven't thought about it once today, or at least before doing the research for this story anyway. Most of us would categorise the risk of death by homicide today as low, remote, whatever. Drowning, ditto. You are about three times more likely to die in a car than being murdered or drowning. But of course, in all these comparisons, the risk in a car includes all of the antisocial driving behaviour I mentioned earlier, which you probably don't indulge in. And that will just slash your risk of dying in a car to an even lower degree than average, obviously. To be fair, I suppose you are far more likely to be murdered if you fail to pay your wholesale crystal meth distributor for last week's retail product. Or if you have a red-hot crack at getting the Hells Angels Harleys to fall over, all like dominoes, outside a pub as a prank. Don't do either of those things, dude. Bad idea. So... If your kid needs a car to help them cross the bridge to adulthood, I would say, forget this bullshit headline and help them. You've been helping them forever, for their entire lives. Don't stop on this account, would be my advice. You're not killing them. You're helping them to grow up. Pro tip, it might be rather nice if you made it the safest car you can reasonably afford in the circumstances, just in case.